أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ما شاء الله it's wonderful to be back in session الحمد لله and we are now on episode 98 now before I get started إن شاء الله تعالى with tonight's uh, lesson, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, we've been doing groupings and because we're on episode 98, we're coming to 100 episodes and inshallah ta'ala at episode 100, we will begin with the seerah of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. And if you're wondering why we took so long, because some of you caught on to the series a little bit later, we were going in order of the people embracing Islam and Aisha radiallahu anha, we spoke about her in the capacity of the life of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. But now insha'Allah ta'ala will be sort of setting the stage for when she becomes an adult in Medina, marries the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that home becomes the center of Medina until today. And then after Aisha radiallahu anha will cover the prominent companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we have not yet covered. So this week and next week, we're going to tell two very important stories that intersect the spirit of the Ansar with the welcoming of the Prophet ﷺ through Quba to settle in Medina, insha'Allah ta'ala, and set the stage for what is left of the series, bidnillahi ta'ala. And the next two stories, you know, we've talked about parents and children quite a bit. So you had the stories of righteous parents and righteous children from the Ansar. So for example, Amr ibn al Jamuh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who we spoke about and his children, Mu'adh and Mu'awwidh, may Allah be pleased with them. Then we spoke about the children of the chief hypocrite, Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul, and his children being two of the most righteous companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His son, Abdullah, being a dedicated protege of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his daughter, Jamila radiallahu ta'ala anha, being married to Hanzala radiallahu anhu, and all that was encompassed in that. And these next two stories have to do with sons and fathers. Righteous father, righteous son, equally dedicated to the Prophet ﷺ. And this is the beauty of the Ansar, that this was a family affair for them. That they gathered around the Prophet ﷺ and sacrificed themselves. So when you have a Nusayba anha, her children were right there with her. And this is something that we're going to see throughout. And tonight is really one of the most beautiful stories of the Ansar. Now I know that I say that a lot, but I really do mean it this time, and not just because I, I, I've spent the time preparing uh, for tonight especially, but a name that I hope, inshallah ta'ala, we start to see more of. So is there anyone in here named Jabr? Where are our Jabr's? No Jabr's, right? So that's gonna change, inshallah ta'ala, because again, we want to name our children after these companions and then raise them, inshallah ta'ala, in their example. So tonight we talk about Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And Jabir radiallahu anhu, out of the prominent narrators of hadith, is probably the one whose biography is least told. He narrates over 1,500 ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so when you think about those that narrated the most hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu obviously, Aisha radiallahu anha, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. Then you have Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu. These are the top narrators of hadiths from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But his biography is not very well known to most people. And inshallah ta'ala that will change uh, tonight, bi'ibnillah. And it's a beautiful story of a family. Now, before I speak about him, I want us to set the tribal, inshallah ta'ala, framework. So he is from the tribe of Banu Salima. Banu Salima. This is the tribe of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. This is the tribe that was led by Amr ibn al-Jamuh radiallahu anhu, who the Prophet sallallahu said, I saw him strolling in Jannah without a limp because he used to have a, a particular uh, disability and he was uh, martyred in the battle of Uhud. This is a prominent tribe of people that immediately galvanized around the Prophet ﷺ and welcomed him to Medina and literally shifted their entire lives to being in the service of the Prophet ﷺ. So Banu Najjar 
were the maternal relatives of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the uh, tribe of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, Umm Sulaym, many who we spoke about. Banu Salima shift their entire lives around the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, one of the famous narrations about them is that they used to have a large area of land around where Masjid al-Qiblatayn is. Okay? So if you go to Medina and you go to Quba, and then to Masjid al-Qiblatayn, Banu Salima owned a large plot of land there. And when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, they wanted to sell all of their land and purchase land right next to the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. The narrator of the hadith is Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu قال خرت البقاع حول المسجد فأراد بنو سلمة أن ينتقلوا قرب المسجد That some of the land around the new masjid of the Prophet ﷺ came available and Banu Salima, we said we're going to pull all of our resources and we're going to purchase that land. We're going to be the neighbors of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَبَلَغَ ذَلِكَ النَّبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فَقَالَ لَهُمْ بَلَغَنِي أَنَّكُمْ تُرِيدُونَ أَن تَنْتَقِلُوا قُرْبَ الْمَسْجِدِ So that reached the Prophet sallallahu So he called us and he said, I've learned that you have decided to purchase the land next to my masjid, to move all of your properties next to my masjid. So we said, Na'am Ya Rasulullah, Qad aradna dhalik. Yes, O Messenger of Allah, that's exactly what we want to do. And the Prophet ﷺ said the very famous words, Ya Bani Salima, diyarakum tuktab atharakum. Ya Bani Salima, diyarakum tuktab atharakum. O Banu Salima, stay in your homes, your footsteps will be written. O Banu Salima, stay in your homes, your footsteps will be written. And you'll be raised by a degree for every footstep you take towards the masjid. Now some of you are like, why did we buy houses next to Valley Ranch Islamic Center again? Why are we, you know, letting them jack up the prices here and take up all these neighborhoods? This is like the Dallas thing, right? Buy houses next to the masjid. There's actually a very important explanation to this hadith that Ibn Hajar rahimahullah mentions, which is that the Prophet ﷺ did not want the community to be concentrated in one area because that would leave the community vulnerable and he wanted the community spread out so that the hypocrites in particular could see the Muslims spread out all around Medina. So even strategically speaking, the Prophet ﷺ did not want everyone to move around the masjid. Okay, so keep your homes next to the masajid. But those of you that come from far away, diyarakum, stay in your homes, your athar, your, your gas prices, your mileage, your footsteps will be written ta'ala as you come to the house of Allah. But this really shows you the attitude of this particular tribe of the Ansar uh, you'll find the Prophet ﷺ praise in many narrations. They always wanted to be around the Prophet ﷺ. They always wanted to be in the service of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram. His father, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram, radiallahu anhu, is actually so central to this seerah, so central to this initial coming of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina. Abdullah ibn Amr was actually the brother-in-law of Amr ibn al-Jamuh, who's the chief of the tribe, and his best friend. So Abdullah's sister Hind is married to Amr ibn al-Jamuh. So they're best friends, they're brother-in-laws, and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram would represent the tribe in certain places. So he's actually one of the first 12 from Medina to pledge allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ in Hajj, the first Bay'atul Aqaba. His father, Jabir's father, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al Haram, was one of the first 12 to pledge allegiance to the Prophet. ﷺ. He comes back to Medina, his wife embraces Islam, all of his siblings embrace Islam. And his children, of course, embrace Islam as well. Now, subhanAllah, he has seven or nine daughters. Seven or nine daughters. There are two narrations. Seven or nine daughters and one son, Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he's got ten kids, eight or ten kids, all daughters and one boy, Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And they all enter into Islam as a family. And they dedicate themselves to Mus'ab ibn Umair, 
radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Jabir was a young boy. He was about 13 or 14 years old. And he becomes a student of Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And of course, you know, Mu'adh ibn Jabal is from this tribe radiallahu anhu. So the youth of that tribe of Banu Salima are really some of the, uh, the main people that are around Mus'ab radiallahu anhu and learning this religion very early on. So they dedicate themselves to Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now Jabir's mother, because oftentimes the, the mother gets left out, right? And this was an incredible sacrifice on the part of both parents. Jabir's mother is named Unaysa bint Anma, a very interesting name. Unaysa bint Anma, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she dedicates herself as well to this religion lovingly and supports her son in his pursuit of the religion. And her brother is a man by the name of Tha'laba ibn Anma. Tha'laba ibn Anma. Tha'laba ibn Anma is one of the idol breakers in Medina. He's one of those who embraces Islam early on as well. So this kind of gives you the household of Jabir. So this would be his maternal uncle, his khal. He's one of those who embraces Islam early on and is amongst those that was breaking the idols of Medina before the Prophet ﷺ comes. And fun fact, the ayah, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَهِلَّةِ They ask you about the month. Tha'laba is the one who is يَسْأَلُونَكَ who is asking the Prophet ﷺ about the months of Islam and the way that the Hilal functions. So this is Jabir's mother, father, his, his uncle, and his father wants him to be committed to the Prophet ﷺ very early on. So he takes him to Bay'atul Aqaba Athaniya, the second bay'ah, the second pledge to the Prophet ﷺ, where you had 72 of the Ansar go to the Prophet ﷺ and take the bay'ah. Jabir says, I was the youngest person there. So his father brought him along the second time and Jabir anhu says, I was the youngest person there to give bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ. So here's the teenager that gets brought along that takes the hand of the Prophet ﷺ and commits himself to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they find themselves in the situation where the Prophet ﷺ then moves towards al Madina, And Jabir says, we were a poor family we were just like many of the Ansar, we'd go out, we'd harvest what we could of the dates, we'd sell them in the marketplace, and then we'd go to the Prophet ﷺ, and we'd serve the Prophet ﷺ in every way. The Battle of Badr comes. I wanted to go out in Badr, I was 15 years old. Now 15 is kind of in that middle mark. There are some companions that the Prophet ﷺ allowed to go at that age, okay? because they were bigger in stature, like Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu And there are some companions that the Prophet ﷺ did not allow at that age. So Jabir is kind of on the border, being a 15-year-old, and he wants to go to Badr. But his father says, I need you to stay home and take care of the family. Okay, so stay home with your mom, stay home with your sisters. And he goes out to Badr by himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the Muslims victory in Badr. His father comes back amongst that victorious group. And then Uhud comes. Now this is subhanAllah one of the rawest moments that you see in the life of a companion because it's a first-hand story that we have from Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu with his father Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says, Da'ani Abi, that my father called me the night before Uhud the night before the Battle of Uhud. SubhanAllah, you can imagine what's going through the minds and the hearts of the people. This huge army is coming from Mecca to kill them. And the last person we talked about, Handala radiallahu anhu, the night before Uhud is his wedding night. Look at the complexities here, SubhanAllah. And here Jabir radiallahu anhu says, my father called me to him the night before Uhud. We're kind of preparing ourselves mentally for what this is going to look like. We have to fight this huge army and there are likely going to be many casualties. So he says that my father says to me, Ya Bunay, O my son, Ma urani illa maqtulan fi awwali man yuqtalu min ashab al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I have a feeling, I have a feeling that I'm going to be from the first people to be killed from the companions of the Prophet. Allah, Allahu alam, did he see a dream? 
Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow something in his heart? Was it just a premonition? What happens here? Allah knows best. But we know some righteous people, subhanAllah, they have a feeling when they're about to go. So it may be that he saw a dream and he's waking his son up and he's saying, look, I saw this dream. Or I have a feeling, but he says, I think I'm going to be of the first people killed on, on the day of Uhud. He says, وَإِنِّي لَا أَتْرُكُ بَعْدِي أَعَزَّ عَلَيَّ مِنْكَ I'm not leaving behind anyone on this earth that I love more than you, that's dearer to me than you. غَيْرَ نَفْسِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. Look at the adab, even when he's talking to his son, except for the Prophet <laughs> This is the ansar. Even in this father-to-son conversation, listen, I'm not leaving behind anyone that is more precious to me than you, O oh my son, except for the Prophet فَإِنَّ عَلَيَّ دَيْنًا فَقْدِي He said, and I have a lot of debt. They were poor people. They used to work, do what they could. They'd wait for the harvest, they'd sell. And he said, I have a lot of debt. So when I pass away, do your best to take care of that debt. وَاسْتَوْصِي بِأَخَوَاتِكَ خَيْرًا And be specially good to your sisters. Be good to your sisters. Take care of your sisters, don't abandon them. You have a huge responsibility. If this feeling that I have is true, that I'm going to be amongst the first people killed in this battle. Please take care of my debts. Please take care of your sisters. Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, at this point, 17 years old, he's like, what, you know, what kind of responsibility are you leaving me with here, right? All these debts, all of these sisters. So he hopes that maybe his father is just preparing for the worst outcome. But maybe it's not going to be the case. And subhanAllah, the very first shaheed on the day of Uhud was Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram. Before even the second attack, he was killed by Sufyan ibn Abd shams The very first shaheed on that day was the father of Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram was martyred, and his best friend and his brother-in-law, Amr ibn al-Jamuh, was martyred. They were both the, the two seniors of this tribe of Banu Salima, and they were both killed. And this was a huge blow to them because these are the two main men of the tribe, and this is the one provider for the entire house of Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so he got the news that his father was a shaheed. And subhanAllah, try to live these raw moments, especially next time you go to Uhud. Every time you go to Uhud, breathe it in a bit. Take it in a bit. He says, Ji abi abi ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa qad muthila bihi. He said that they brought my father to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa qad muthila bihi means they, they mutilated him. So the Quraysh obviously did not just want to kill as many people from the Muslims as they lost in Badr. They wanted to humiliate them. They wanted to emotionally and psychologically break down the Muslims. So they mutilated the dead bodies. So they brought my father to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and he was mutilated. And you could see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi as if he, like he turned away, like it hurt him to see that. Every one of the dead of the Sahaba on the day of Uhud, it moved the Prophet Because these people ultimately, they stood with him, right? They, they didn't have to take on this, this mission from Mecca, but they took it on. And most of the dead of Uhud, of the 73 martyrs, over 60 of them were Ansar, people of Medina. So the Prophet Sallallahu he clearly was disturbed by the image of my father as he was mutilated. And then they covered him with a sheet. They quickly covered his face with a sheet. So he said, فَذَهَبْتُ أَكْشِفُ عَنْ وَجْهِهِ So I went, I mean this is his son. I went and I tried to expose this, I was trying to see my father. Right? SubhanAllah, it's painful. How do you stop the son from seeing his dead father? So he said, so I'm throwing myself and I'm trying to get the blanket or get the sheet off of my father's face so I could see his face. And he says, فَنَهَانِي قَوْمِي My people were stopping me. So they were all trying to stop me from, from seeing the face of my father. But he said, the Prophet was not forbidding me. The Prophet as if he, he said, let him see him. 
Let them see. You know, sometimes, subhanAllah, the wisdom of a leader as well, right, is the, the thought of what it might be going to torture you more than the actual sight. The compassion of the Prophet Sallallahu when he sees the son saying, let me see my father, let me see my father, the Prophet Sallallahu says, let him see him. So he said, so I saw him. And he said, I started to weep. Now the Prophet Sallallahu did not stop the weeping. He said, but then he heard the sound of a woman who shrieked. She shrieked, right? She saw the body and she shrieked. And Rasulullah Sallallahu said, who was that? Who shrieked like that? So they said Fatima bint Amr, the sister, Fatima bint Amr. When she saw Abdullah, she shrieked. And the Prophet ﷺ said to her, do not cry, la tabki. Or he said, whether you cry or not, he said, ma zalat al-mala'ika tulilluhu bi ajnihatiha. The angels covered the soul of Abdullah ibn Amr all the way until he reached the heavens. Like when he was carried to the heavens as he was martyred, the angels have continued to keep their wings over him until now. SubhanAllah, like he is being celebrated in the heavens right now. Don't weep too much. I know that the sight of a, a person who was killed is very difficult. And as the Prophet ﷺ, uh, starts to collect the bodies of the shuhada of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ, he buried Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-Haram and Amr ibn al-Jamuh in one kafan. Okay, in one kafan, one grave, he put them together because they were best friends. SubhanAllah. So they loved Allah together, they served the Prophet together, and they were martyred together. Therefore, the Prophet buried them together. And of course, in Uhud, the people were, were stacked. So he put them together, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, that I saw my aunt, subhanAllah, think about the pain here, Hind, who is the wife of Amr ibn al-Jamuh and the sister of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-Haram. I saw her taking the bodies and putting them, you know, loading the bodies onto her camel so that she could take them back to Medina. And the Prophet said, no, the, the shuhada should be buried where they passed away. And the Prophet buried them in one grave. Awfully traumatic for Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, traumatic for every single person that had to witness that death, that shahada of Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Amr radiallahu anhu and so many of the other companions. Jabir radiallahu anhu says, and my tragedy is compounded by what? Now I've got a hand, I've got debts and I've got all my sisters to take care of. What do I do? So he says, the Prophet ﷺ comes to me after some time and he says, Ya Jabir, ma li araka mun kasiran. Oh Jabir, why do I see you broken? SubhanAllah, the empathy of the Messenger ﷺ. And you're going to see, SubhanAllah, how the Prophet ﷺ takes care of the grieving of his community. Ma li araka mun kasiran. What's wrong, Jabir? You look so broken. You look like you're not, you have no happiness anymore. You're a young man. Why are you so broken hearted? What's wrong, O Jabir? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, my father has been killed and I have all these deaths to take care of. And he left behind so many daughters. I have all of my sisters to take care of. And the Prophet wasallam, he said to Jabir, Ya Jabir, do you want me to tell you something? about your father? Like I saw something about your father. Do you want me to tell you something about your father? SubhanAllah. An image of him in the new realm, you know, when people pass away, the shuhada pass away into this new realm. So I said, Bala Ya Rasulullah, yes, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I saw your father. And he said, SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, ma kallam Allahu ahadan qat illa min wara'i hijab. Allah has never spoken to anyone except from behind a veil. He said, وَكَلَّمَ أَبَاكَ kifahan." Except your, for your father, Allah spoke to him without a hijab, with no veil. SubhanAllah. Like your father was raised to the heavens and Allah spoke to him kifahan, with no veil. And you're thinking like, wow, this doesn't even happen with the prophets. This doesn't even happen with the prophets, right? Like what a unique gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon this man. Truly Allah saw something special in his heart. 
He said Allah spoke to him with no veil between them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya Abdi, tamanna alayya, O oh my slave, make any wish that you want, or atik, I'll give it to you. O oh my slave, make any wish that you want, I will give it to you. Ask me anything. And what will the people say in Jannah when they see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Allah make us amongst those who get to stare at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are they going to say at that point when they're seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah make us amongst them, Ya Rabbul Alameen. And you're looking at Allah and Allah says, what do you want? <laughs> and you just want to do more for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that point. Like you don't want Allah to give you more. You just want to give more for Him at that point because you're so enamored by His beauty subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... Abdullah is getting a preview of this now. No other human being, no other companion, no other person, the Prophet ﷺ said, had this gift that the gift of Abu Jabir had. And so he says, Tamanna alayya, go ahead and ask of me anything. Qala, Ya Rabb, tuhyini fa uqtalu fi kathaniya. Ya Rabb, send me back to the, light, to, to the life of this world and I'll be martyred in your cause again. SubhanAllah. Like, with all the generosity that you are showing to me, all of the mercy, all of the beauty, to Hyini, take me back to that world. Let me die for you again. Let me die for you again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, Innahu sabaqa minni annahum ilayha la yarji'un. But it's already been decreed that they will not return to this life after they leave it. I'm not going to send anyone back to the dunya after I've taken them out of it. So he says, Ya Rabb, fa'ablig man wara'i. Oh my Lord, can you tell those that I've left behind that I'm okay? Can you tell them what I'm living in? Can you tell my son? Can you tell my family just the ni'mah that I'm in right now, the blessing that I'm in right now? And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ فَرِحِينَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Do not think of those that have been slain in the way of Allah as dead. Rather, they are alive, enjoying their Lord. فَرِحِينَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ They are celebrating and in so much joy with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon them from His bounty. وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ And they're waiting for those to join them. أَلَّا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Don't worry about them, there's no fear upon them, nor shall they ever grieve. Don't worry about them, they are not worried. Don't be sad for them, they are not sad. So this ayah comes, subhanAllah, as a direct conversation between a shaheed of Uhud and the shuhada of Uhud with their Lord to say to the people that have been left behind, we're okay, we're taken care of. SubhanAllah, imagine what this meant to Jabir radiallahu anhu to hear that his father had this particular ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now something interesting happens after as well. If you go to Sahih al-Bukhari in Kitab al-Jana'az, there is bab, هَلْ يُخْرَجُ الْمَيِّتُ مِنَ الْقَبْرِ وَالْلَحْدِ لِعِلَّةِ The chapter of can the dead body be taken out of the grave after it has been buried for a reason, for a purpose. Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu says in the continuation of this, لَمْ تَطِبْ نَفْسِي أَنْ أَتْرُكَهُ مَعَ الْآخَرِ I didn't, you know, I, I thought after some time that I didn't want my father to just be in one kafan. You know, this was sort of an emergency thing. So I thought, let me go and move my father just to the, next to his companion and give him his own separate kafan. So to just carve out a space, as the ulama say of hadith, so that he could be buried right next to Amr ibn al-Jamuh radiallahu ta'ala anhu but separate the grave a little bit. So he said, I could not, I couldn't come to terms with it. I wanted to bury him separately in that sense. قَالَ فَاسْتَخْرَجْتُ فَاسْتَخْرَجْتُهُ بَعْدَ سِتَّةِ أَشْهُرِ So he said, so I took his body after six months and moved it to the side. قَالَ فَإِذَا هُوَ كَيَوْمِ وَضَعْتُهُ هُنَيَّةً غَيْرَ أُذُنِهِ He said, and what I saw was that he was exactly like the day that he died, six months later. Remember this, by the way, because the story doesn't end with this, subhanAllah. He says, six months later, the body of my father was fresh. He was like the day that we buried him six months ago, full of misk, beautiful scents. He looked like he was resting, like he had just taken a shower. He said, except for a little bit on his ear. Like the only effect of the grave on him for six months was a little bit on his ear. 
Other than that, his entire body was as fresh as the day we buried him six months ago. Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. May Allah be pleased with Jabir and his father and his entire family. Allahumma ameen. So that's just before we even start with the journey of Jabir radiallahu anhu with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Here you have a teenager now and he has a ton of debt and he has seven or nine sisters that are dependent upon him. And this is actually some context to the hadith where the Prophet asked Jabir anhu about his marriage. Jabir married a woman who was significantly older than him. A woman that was significantly older than him. Now is there anything wrong in Islam with that? Absolutely not. But some people use the hadith without the context. The Prophet said, فَهَلَّا جَارِيَةً تُلَاعِبُهَا وَتُلَاعِبُكَ Jabir, why, why, don't, why didn't you marry someone or why don't you marry someone as young as you so that you can be intimate with her, she can be intimate with you you can enjoy your life together. Now, the Prophet ﷺ himself married a much older woman in Khadija radiallahu anha. So what's the Prophet ﷺ saying? He sees Jabir radiallahu anhu and Jabir marries a woman much, much older than him who was uh, widowed. And there seems to be a reason behind it. So the Prophet ﷺ says, well, why didn't you marry someone that's younger, that's like your age, similar to you? And you could enjoy one another and you could share those moments together. And he said, and it's a few narrations, قُلْتُ إِنَّ أَبِي تَوُفِّيَ وَتَرَكَ بَنَاتِ فَأَحْبَبْتُ أَنْ أَتَزَوَّجْ امْرَأَةً تَجْمَعُهُنَّ وَتَمْشُطُهُنَّ وَتَقُومُ عَلَيْهِنَّ تُعَلِّمُهُنَّ وَتُؤَدِّبُهُنَّ I combined a few narrations here. That said, I wanted to marry a woman that would be almost like another mom to my sisters, that would help me with my sisters. So she could, he literally says, uh, bring them together, comb their hair, teach them, uh, you know, teach them manners, teach them what they need in life. So I needed help in the household. So he said, SubhanAllah, that's why I, I married a woman that's much, much older uh, than I am that could help me with that. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Fadalik, which means well done, right? So it shows you the life circumstances, the pragmatism of marriage, even in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Like I needed help in the household, and that was the nature of even his marriage. So he married a woman by the name of Suhayma. Suhayma bint Mas'ud, Suhayma bint Mas'ud, and she was actually uh, the daughter of his aunt, the daughter of his aunt, Ashamus bint Amr, the daughter of his aunt, and his wife is Suhayma radiallahu ta'ala anha, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them despite her old age, and there was the thought that she would not be able, she was past the age of childbirth, Allah blessed them with two children, Abdurrahman and Um Habib, so a son and a daughter. So that's now his marriage, his sisters, his debt. This is going to concern him quite a bit on top of the grief of what he just witnessed, the trauma of what he just witnessed with his father and his family still reeling from that, even though the Prophet ﷺ had given them great comfort in this regard. So people are bothering him now for debts. The time comes and you know, after some time goes on, his dad owed a lot of people money. So people come and they start bothering him for their repayment of debt. And Jabir is so stressed out, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Ya Rasulullah, he doesn't ask him to pay the debt, but subhanAllah, look what he says. He says, Uridu an yarak al -ghurama. He said, can you just come with me so the debtors can at least see you with me? And maybe they'll take it easy on me. They won't be as aggressive in trying to collect the debt from me. So just come with me, Ya Rasulullah. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ is a busy man. He's tending to the entire ummah, right? Can you just kind of hang out with me so they can see you with me that way? They'll take it easy on me. They'll be a little bit shy to, to push me too much for uh, the debts, the Prophet ﷺ said. Absolutely. So Rasulullah ﷺ sitting next to him. <laughs> Imagine if you're a Muslim and you got to come collect the debt from Jabir and the Prophet ﷺ sitting with him. Not intimidating him, but the Prophet ﷺ is saying, Aysir, Aysir, take it easy on him. And he's helping him negotiate his debt. Can he pay it back over six months? Can he pay it back over 10 months? Can he pay it back over a year? Can we work out a deal with him? This is the Prophet ﷺ being a good friend, an intercessor on his behalf. And this is one of the rewardable things that we have as Muslims when you go and you argue on behalf of, or you intercede on behalf of someone. Ibn Abbas left the masjid in the last 10 nights of Ramadan to go do this for somebody, right? To just argue or, or say to someone that's owed money, hey, can you take it easy? Give him some time. Can you work out something? Can we do something different that doesn't put too much stress on the person that is in debt? SubhanAllah, look how beautiful Islam is. Riba is haram, 
interest is haram, so you don't bury the person in late payments, and it's praiseworthy for you to go and try to help someone out, even if you can't financially, and say, look, can you take it easy on this brother? Can you take it easy on the sister? Can we stretch it out? Is there any other way that we can try to resolve the situation? So this is happening until there's one problem. His father owed non-Muslims money too. So a Jewish man comes. And the, the allure of the Prophet ﷺ isn't going to work here. Right? So he says to him, I want you to pay me back right now. Jabir says, you know, can I pay it in two batches? The Prophet ﷺ is watching this and the man is saying, no, I want it now. The Prophet ﷺ intercedes. He says, Ya Abel Qasim, which is what they would say to the Prophet ﷺ, they call him by his kunya, which is respectful. O father of Qasim, I need my money now. <laughs> like with all due respect, I need this money right now. I'm not going to delay any debts. And it's not that he was being abusive, but he was saying, I need my money right now. So Jabir became extremely stressed out. So the Prophet ﷺ says to me, Jabir is narrating this in first person, he says to me, go take your, your dates and then divide your dates into categories. The ajwa, the rutab, the different types of dates. Put them in different stacks, put them in different categories. And then call me once you're done. So just go harvest what you can from your garden. This is the ansar, that's all they have are some dates. Go pick your dates, put them in piles, and then call me when you're finished. So Jabir says, I did that. And he said, the Prophet Wasallam came and Rasulullah started to invoke his barakah, his blessings on all of the tamar, all of the different dates. So the Prophet made dua over all of the dates. And the Prophet told Jabir, now go pay everybody back. So Jabir says, I started to take bags and I started to put the dates in them and I started to go, I paid the Jewish man back, I paid everybody back and I'd come back and the dates were not touched, meaning the surplus was still there. There was nothing being taken, it was as if I wasn't even taking from the piles. The piles just kept on retaining their weight. And by the time I finished paying everybody off, the piles were exactly as the moment the Prophet ﷺ made dua over them. Now Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, one, of, one of the narrators of this, he smiled and he said, I knew the moment the Prophet ﷺ walked into that garden that those dates were going to be blessed. SubhanAllah, that the Prophet ﷺ was going to work a miracle for Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So this is the beginning of the debts being paid off. This is the beginning of his marriage. Then he says, Rasulullah had 21 battles in his life. He said, I attended 19 of them and I never left his side. What does that mean? That means I missed the first two because my father told me not to go to Badr and not to go to Uhud. But he said, the rest of the 19, I never left the side of the Prophet I stayed with him for the entirety of his life sallallahu alaihi wasallam and I was next to him in all of the ghazawat in all of the battles and he mentions the next miracle now by the way I'm going to say this and I'm going to give a, a shout out Dr. Nazir Khan who's one of our directors mashallah just had a baby named Jabir may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and when he sent me the message I said subhanallah that's my next lecture is actually on Jabir radiallahu anhu and I asked him why he chose the name Jabir because Jabir is not a common name and he said, because I realized that most of the ahadith of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ are narrated by Jabir radiallahu anhu, which is true. If you took the dala'il of the Prophet ﷺ, most of the hadiths of miracles, Jabir radiallahu anhu is there. He's present and sometimes it's being worked even for him. Which is so beautiful in and of itself because Jabir was the most disadvantaged of society at this point. He's an orphan, he's got a lot to take care of and miracles of surplus are coming his way. So, Jabir radiallahu anhu says, كَانَ أَوَّلَ مَا غَزَوْتُ مَعَهُ حَمْرَاءُ الْأَسَدِ So I went out with the Prophet ﷺ in Hamra al-Asad, which is 10 months after Uhud. So it's right after his father passed away. Things are still very, very fresh. And he said, كُنْتُ مَعَ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم I was with the Prophet ﷺ فَكُنْتُ عَلَى جَمَلٍ ثَقَالٍ I was on a really slow camel. A really, really slow camel. He still wasn't rich here. He paid off his debts, but he's still not rich. So he's driving that car in the back, right, that's kind of barely making it through, while the others have kind of gone ahead in Hamra al-Asad. So he says that, 
Kuntu fi akhir al qawm. I was literally the last person of the army. Qala fa marra bi al Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa qal man hada. The Prophet ﷺ is a leader. What does he do? The Prophet ﷺ circles around the entire army, checks up on people, make sure that everything is okay. This Messenger ﷺ dispatches from behind, and then Ali anhu says, by the time the battle starts, the Prophet ﷺ is out front and we're fighting behind him. This is the courage, the care, the leader, Rasulullah. ﷺ. So he catches me all the way at the back and he says, Man hadha? Who is that? Because it was nighttime. فَقُلْتُ جَابِرُ بْنُ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ I'm Jabir ibn Abdullah, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet said, Malik, what's wrong with you? Why are you all the way back here? قُلْتُ إِنِّي عَلَى جَمَلٍ ثَقَالِ Ya Rasulullah, I have a really, really slow camel. So the Prophet said, he got off of his own camel, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, أَمَعْكَ قَضِيب you, you have a stick uh, or something to, uh, you know, to move the, the camel, you gotta move the camel, you gotta move the horse, do you have a stick with you? So he said, so I handed him, a stick. So the Prophet وسلم, he tapped the camel and he made a dua sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and suddenly this camel just transformed. And it became an entirely different animal. So afterwards what ends up happening is the Prophet وسلم, says get back on the camel. Jabir starts going way ahead of everybody. So it's like what happened to his camel because he was all the way in the back and now Jabir radiallahu anhu is all the way up front. And by the way, subhanAllah, this incident is narrated in every one of the books of hadith, which is beautiful. It's literally in every single book of hadith from Bukhari Muslim onwards. So he was all the way up front and he's excited. He's a young kid. He's got his camel all the way up front. And now they're telling him slow down. They were telling him catch up before and now they're saying slow down. And he's saying to the Prophet ﷺ, he's calling out to the Prophet ﷺ, and he's saying, Bi barakatika ya Rasulullah, bi barakatika ya Rasulullah, this is your baraka ya Rasulullah, like I've got this awesome camel that's now going ahead of everybody, right? Then the Prophet ﷺ says, Jabir, bi'nihi, sell me the camel. <laughs> Jabir's like, what? <laughs> I just got all excited, I have this camel now that goes ahead of everybody. I don't want to sell this camel. Like this is, this thing is amazing now, right? And the Prophet some says, "Sell me the camel." And Jabir says, "Look, I really didn't want to sell him the camel, but I'm not going to say no to the Prophet sallam. And he just, he's the one that worked something on this camel that changed it into what it is. So out of adab with the Prophet sallam, he said, "Ya Rasulullah, no, I'm not going to sell it to you. Just take it, like it's a gift." And the Prophet sallam says, "Ghafar Allahu lak bi'ni." May Allah forgive you, sell it to me. May Allah forgive you, sell it to me. May Allah forgive you, sell it to me. And the Prophet ﷺ starts throwing out numbers to him. May Allah forgive you, sell it to me. May Allah forgive you, sell it to me. And I'm like, Ya Rasulullah, take it. May Allah forgive you, sell it to me. Ya Rasulullah, take it. May Allah forgive you, sell it to me. And he said, رضي الله تعالى عنه استغفر لي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ليلة البعير خمسا وعشرين مرة he said, the Prophet ﷺ made istighfar for me. He sought forgiveness for me on the night of the camel. So he has a name for it, the night of the camel. He said, he made, he sought forgiveness for me 25 times. Meaning 25 times the Prophet ﷺ said, Ghafar Allahu lak. May Allah forgive you, just sell it to me. Stop trying to give it to me. Sell it to me. I'm trying to give you money here. And the Prophet ﷺ puts out a number. So eventually, fine, four dinars and a little bit more. The Prophet ﷺ would always give more than what he agreed upon. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that was his, uh, his deal. And Jabir radiallahu anhu agrees to it, just finally at the end, and Jabir radiallahu anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, can I ride it at least till we get back to Medina? Prophet Sallallahu said, fine, you can have it until Medina. Right, go ahead and ride it back to Medina. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is, he smiles at him, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi goes next to him, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he grabs the reins of the camel as it's going forward, and the Prophet ﷺ says, Al Jamalu Jamaluna. Al Jamalu Jamaluna. This camel is our camel. You know that, right? Jabir's like, Yeah, I know. You know, this is not my camel, but he's enjoying this fine ride for the last time. He says, Then we get to Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Bilal, aqdihi wa zidhu. O Bilal, give him his payment and increase him. So he gave him an entire uqiyah of gold, which is a lot, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, hand over the camel. So Jabir gives him the cam camel, and then he starts to walk away, and the Prophet ﷺ said, calls him back, he says, Al-thamanu wal-jamalu lak, ya Jabir. 
the money and the camels for you, O Japheth. He said, did you really think I was going to take your camel? You really thought I was going to take advantage of you? The money and the camel is for you, O Jabir. And you know what Jabir says? He said, Wallahi. He was in his 90s. He was in his 90s. You're not mishearing me. In his 90s, narrating the hadith, he said, That money the Prophet gave me, I'm still benefiting from it somehow. And subhanAllah, the, the money he gave me, that one uqiyah of gold, the investment that came out of it is still ongoing. So I'm still benefiting from this miracle from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's still sustaining me. And SubhanAllah, you find so many of the ahadith of the shama'il of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the attributes of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, narrated by Jabir radiallahu anhu, and they directly relate to him. When Jabir radiallahu anhu says, the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kullu ma'roofin sadaqa. Every act of kindness is a charity. Every act of kindness is a charity. Every time the Prophet ﷺ smiled at him, every time the Prophet ﷺ gave him something, every time the Prophet ﷺ asked for him, كُلُّ مَعْرُوفٍ صَدَقَةً Every single charity is a sadaqah. And عَنْ جَابِرْ And you'll hear this many times. عَنْ جَابِرْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ قَالْ مَا سُؤِلَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ شَيْئًا فَقَالَ لَا The Prophet ﷺ was never asked for anything and he said no. If you ask the Prophet ﷺ for something, the Prophet ﷺ was so generous. Even if he didn't have, he was always giving Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, I, I saw that with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jabir radiallahu anhu also narrates the, uh, an authentic hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, the food of one is enough for two, the food of two is enough for four, the food of four is enough for eight. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ was encouraging the Sahaba to share their food, share their food. And it was frequent that the Prophet ﷺ would take Jabir with him to eat with him. Knowing Jabir's situation, he's always caring for him. SubhanAllah, he's asking about him, he's spending on him, he's giving him a camel, he's giving him a new car, right? Gives him money that's going to suffice him forever, takes care of his debts. And he says, this is a beautiful hadith, it's narrated by Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. عن جابر رضي الله عنه قال أخذ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بيدي ذات يوم إلى منزله فأخرج إليه Filaqan min khubz. Said the Prophet ﷺ once took my hand and he took me to his house. Grabbed me by the hand, he said, Jabir, come to my house with me. And he sat me down in his house and the Prophet ﷺ said, what do we have to eat? SubhanAllah, I saw a video of this recently, like uh, some hif schools overseas and they, they bring bags and they just put some bread, some dry pieces of bread, whatever they could find. All they had in the house of the Prophet ﷺ was a few broken pieces of bread, literally. So there's no meat. There is nothing special here, just some broken pieces of bread. And the Prophet ﷺ, so content. He says, Mamun Udum, is there anything to, uh, to dip it in? Right? Anything to at least dip the bread in? Any leban, anything to dip it in? And they said, the only thing we have is shay'un min al khal. We just have a little bit of vinegar. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ni'm al Udum. Vinegar is a great dip. SubhanAllah, look how simple. So the Prophet said, bring me the vinegar. So he put the vinegar and Jabir radiallahu anhu says, فَمَا زِلْتُ, فما زلت أُحِبُّ الْخَلَّ مُنْذُ سَمِعْتُهَا مِنْ نَبِيِّ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ From that day I started loving vinegar from the moment that I heard the Prophet say, what a great thing to dip your, your, your bread in, just vinegar. Because most people would belittle it and say, that's all we have, some vinegar. And he said, نِعْمَ الْأُدُمْ What a great dip it is to dip into vinegar. And Jabir says, I started loving to dip my bread in vinegar. وَقَالَ طَلْحَ مَا زِلْتُ أُحِبُّ الْخَلَّ مُنْذُ سَمِعْتُهَا مِنْ جَابِرْ And Talha, who's narrating from Jabir, says, and I started loving it too because I narrated it from Jabir, from the Prophet It shows you the Sahaba with the Messenger وسلم, how this was a culture being created here, right? This was a culture. This wasn't just some text here and there. This was an entire culture. And then you have another time where Jabir gets sick. عَادَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَأَنَا لَا أَعْقِلْ He was so sick, رضي الله تعالى عنه. You know, when you're so sick, you can't even think properly, you can't even move, you can't stand up, the fever is so hot. So the Prophet ﷺ came to visit me, and I was so sick. فَتَوَضَّأَ وَصَبَّ عَلَيَّ مِنْ وُضُوئِهِ The Prophet ﷺ made wudu into a vessel, and then he poured the water onto me. And he said that it was as if I was completely healed instantly. 
SubhanAllah, this is the care of the Prophet وسلم, another miracle from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then you have Khandaq, Battle of the Trench. What a beautiful story, SubhanAllah, in th these moments. He said that during the trench, the day of the trench, Khandaq, he said they came to the Prophet and they complained to him when they came across a boulder that they couldn't move as they were digging the trench. And he said, I saw the Prophet and he said, I'm coming. And Rasulullah got up and he had stones tied to his stomach. And he said, he was so starved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that his stomach was, was bloated. You know, like when, when someone's bloated out of hunger, the Prophet, he'd never seen the Prophet in that sight before. So the Prophet was starving so much that he was bloated out of his hunger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they recognized that extreme hunger. So the Prophet is going and he said that we had not tasted food, meaning the companions in three days. So what about the Prophet ﷺ? He always ate last. He always served others before himself. So you can only imagine how long it was before the Prophet ﷺ got to taste some food. So he said the Prophet ﷺ came and he struck the boulder and he continued to dig with them. And he said that I went to my wife, Suhaima. I said to her, I saw the Prophet in a way that I can't handle. I can't bear to see him this way. Just that I saw him just so hungry. He was bloated out of hunger. You could see the energy of the Prophet. You could hear the hunger in his voice, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it bothered him. So he said, I said to my wife, Do you have anything for us to, to serve him? So she said, I've got some wheat and I have one more small goat. All we possess at this point is a small goat. So Jabir anhu says to her, then how about you slaughter the goat and prepare the wheat? Let me go get the Prophet So she says as she's sending him out, Jabir, don't make me look bad with the Prophet Right? Like make sure you just kind of let him know. Don't go announce it to everybody that we have food. And then we'll be in trouble. Because we barely have any food. We don't even have food for ourselves. So a little bit of food maybe you know, for the Prophet ﷺ and maybe one or two other people. So Jabir says, I walked up to the Prophet ﷺ in the khandaq. I whispered to him, I said, Ya Rasulullah, I've got a little bit of food. If you want to come, you, maybe one or two other of the companions, come to my house. It doesn't work with the Prophet ﷺ. So he said, Qama alayhi salatu wassalam. Qala, Ya ahla khandaq. The Prophet ﷺ didn't stand up and say one tribe. He stood up in the trench and he said, Ya Ahla Khandaq, all people of the trench. O oh, people of the trench. Inna Jabiran qad sana'a su'ran. Jabir has prepared a dish for us. Fahayya hallam bikum. Come on, let's go to Jabir's house. All of us. Put down the shovels, the axes. Can you imagine Suhayma in the house hearing the traffic coming to her home with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi so Jabir is like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and the Prophet says to Jabir, listen, go tell your wife to not touch the meat or the bread until I get there. Tell her, keep the meat and the bread in the pots until I get there. So Jabir is running home, trying to get ready. And he said, I told her that the whole army is coming with me. And she said, what did you say to him? And, she's, and he said, I said what you told me to say. I just said, you know, I have enough food for you and maybe one or two other people. And she said, well, did he ask you to, to prepare for everybody? So Jabir anhu said, yes. So she was content, a righteous woman. The Prophet is going to take care of us somehow. Let's see how this goes, right? And so the Prophet comes to the house before everybody else. He says, where is the pot of meat? Where is the pot? With bread, she was trying to make some stew with the little meat she had, get the bread ready. And the Prophet وسلم, he took some of his spit, his blessed spit, alayhi salatu wasalam, he put it in the pots, and then the Prophet وسلم, made dua. And Rasulullah started to take bread and meat out of the pots, and he started to serve all of the companions with his own blessed hands. Imagine him walking around with the pots, 
serving the Sahaba. And this is a widely narrated miracle, by the way, from the companions. They don't even know, subhanAllah, how this is all coming out of these two pots. Rasulullah is going, he's giving them bread, he's giving them meat. Jabir radiallahu anhu says, Wallahi, there were over a thousand people that day. A thousand people that ate from those two pots from the hand of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then afterwards, the pots were still full. So it didn't even empty out with them. Rasulullah brought back the pots to my wife and he said to my wife, Kuli hadha wa ahdi, eat some of this and then give some of it. Fa'inna nasa asabatum maja'a. People are hungry these days. SubhanAllah, consideration. So keep this for yourself, enjoy the food, enjoy this blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But people are hungry, so if you see people that are hungry, continue to bestow upon them this blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you. So Jabir witnessed that in his own home. He witnessed the miracle in the home of the Prophet ﷺ. He witnessed it with his camel. He's witnessing it with every single fiber of his being, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And remember, he says, I was with the Prophet ﷺ in every single one of the incidents afterwards. So he says that I was with the Prophet ﷺ in Hudaybiyah. And the Prophet ﷺ said to us on the day of Hudaybiyah, أَنْتُمُ الْيَوْمَ خَيْرُ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ you people in Hudaybiyah are the best people on the face of the earth. Who are the people of Hudaybiyah? They're the people of Bay'atul Ridwan. They are the people who took the pledge with the Prophet ﷺ in the famous pledge of Ridwan that Allah says he was pleased with in the Quran. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you are the most beloved people to Allah on the face of the earth. And Jabir anhu was one of them. قَالَ وَكُنَّا أَلْفًا وَأَرْبَعَ مِئَةً We were 1,400 people and we were running out of water for wudu and running out of drinking water and Rasulullah asked for a pot containing water the Prophet performed wudu with it and the Prophet started to pour the water between his fingers and he said come take this water هَذَا بَرَكَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ This is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of us were able to come forward and do wudu under the hand of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and drink from the hand of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, and I kept on drinking and drinking and drinking because I knew that the blessings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would never run out. I've seen this play out too many times. I've seen it. And so I knew that there was no limit to the blessing from the hand of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Finally, Hajjatul Wada. Hajjatul Wada. I want you to read about the farewell hajj of the Prophet ﷺ. If you open any book of hadith and you read about the farewell hajj of the Prophet ﷺ, the longest narration and the most comprehensive narration of Hajjat al-Wada' is from Jabir radiallahu anhu. He narrates the entire hajj of the Prophet ﷺ. Everything from when the Prophet ﷺ left Medina to the speeches that the Prophet ﷺ gave to the sacrifice of the Prophet ﷺ, to his actions in Mina, Jabir radiallahu anhu is the only companion that narrates it from start to finish without any interruption. Meaning if you just read the, and in fact if you go back, subhanAllah, a few years ago I did a series in the Hijjah uh, on the Hajj of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Literally the Hadith of Jabir is a story by itself. You don't even have to piece together narrations. It gives you the entire Hajj of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. After the Prophet sallallahu alayhi passes away, uh, Jabir radiallahu anhu would live for a very, very, very long time. And this is something about those that narrated many hadith is that they lived long, right? Now, the fact that they lived long meant two things. Number one, we got to benefit from their knowledge as an ummah. Number two, they got to see some of the unfortunate trials and tribulations in the fitna. So they were heartbroken by what they would see of the fitna, of the slander, of the uh, assassinations of just the way that uh, the plots and the planning divided people within this ummah and they were heartbroken by that. So Jabir radiallahu anhu was blessed in that he lived long enough to give us so many ahadith and Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu also uh, witnessed the fitna. He served alongside Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu in every one of those battles. So he was a once amongst those that defended Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and stayed with Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu throughout uh, the various battles. And he lived long enough to where he hit over 90 years old and he went blind. And subhanAllah, he was so averse to the fitna, to the trials and tribulations, it wasn't what he wanted, that he didn't even want to hear about it. 
You know, he actually, subhanAllah, served in multiple armies. So he served in, uh, under Khalid radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the conquest of Damascus. He was there. He was there in multiple battles in Asham and all over the world. And he gets old and he doesn't see anymore. And when they'd come to him and they'd tell him about different things that were happening, subhanAllah, he said, Layta sam'i qad dhahaba kama dhahaba basari. I wish my hearing would go away the way my sight went away. Because I don't even like to hear the things that are happening uh, amongst the, uh, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu and of course the generations to follow in the fitna, uh, the tribulations that took place. He would live all the way until the year nine, until he was 94 years old, 78 years after Hijrah. Uh, he is the last major companion to die in Medina. Now SubhanAllah, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he says the last major Sahabi to die period. He is the last major Sahabi to die in Medina. Imagine being in Medina and the last companion is going. The last Sahabi is breathing his last in Medina, the last major companion, a piece of history dying in front of your eyes. Jabir radiallahu anhu was a frequent teacher in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He narrates from al Khulafa al-Rashidin, so many of the ahadith of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali come from Jabir. He narrates from the wives of the Prophet sallallahu and he narrates to Hassan al-Basri, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, the best of the tabi'een, Ata. They were all his students. So Jabir was a link in Medina between the history of the Prophet sallallahu and those tabi'een, those eager scholars from that next generation that wanted to learn. And I'll give you two more quick stories. I know I went long. It won't be this long next week, inshaAllah ta'ala. But one of them just to show you how much Jabir radiallahu anhu wanted to preserve every hadith. Jabir, when he was in his late age, so he was, he was almost dead, he heard about a hadith that someone had in a sham, and he wanted to hear it himself. And it was Abdullah ibn Unais. So Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that I purchased the camel and I made my way, this long journey to Syria, to hear the hadith myself. So when he reached Asham, he went to the house of Abdullah ibn Unais. So I told him that Jabir is at the door. So the messenger goes and tells Abdullah ibn Unais, and he's kind of relaxed in his house, that Jabir ibn Abdullah is at your front door. And it's like, what in the world? Jabir ibn Abdullah from Medina, the companion of the Prophet and he's the greatest of them that's still alive. He's at my door? He said, he's at your door. So he quickly threw on what he had. فَخَرَجَ فَأَعْتَنَقِي فَأَعْتَنَقَنِي So he came out and then he uh, hugged me, he embraced me. So Javid is narrating the hadith with this whole context. He said, Abdullah ibn Unais came out and he embraced me. And I said to him, Hadithun balaghani lam asma'uhu That there's a hadith that I heard or that has come to me that I have not heard myself. خَشِيتُ أَنْ أَمُوتَ أَوْ تَمُوت I was afraid I'd die or you would die before I'd get it from you. So I wanted to come here if you heard this from the Prophet So what is it that you heard from the Prophet Abdullah ibn Unais had one hadith, right? One particular hadith. I think in total he might have five or six in the entire books of hadith, but this is like this one hadith. And it's the hadith about the hashr, about the day of judgment when the people are gathered. Yuhsharullah, uh, that Allah, yahsharullah, uh, Al-Ibad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would gather all of his slaves Uratan, Ghuzlan, Buhman That Allah would gather all of the slaves of Allah, all of the people in their original state In their original state And it's a long hadith لَيْسَ مَعَهُمْ شَيْءٍ They have nothing فَيُنَادِيهِمْ بِصَوْتٍ يَسْمَعُهُ مَنْ بَعُدَ That Allah would call out to them with a voice that the one who is furthest away would still hear, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, would say that Ana al Malik, I am the king. None of the people of Jannah will enter Jannah, and none of the people of Jahannam who are seeking something for some injustice that was done to them will enter the fire until I judge them. Meaning that this is the day of judgment, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge them at this point. So, subhanAllah, this is the hadith, and it's a longer hadith, but for the sake of time, he went out all the way to Asham just to get this one hadith. This is Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And I have one more narration that is mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. You know, when you go to Uhud, 
and you stand in front of these graves and you realize that these bodies are fresh, like the day that it happened. 46 years, 46 years after Uhud. It's narrated in Muwatta from Abd Rahman ibn Abi Sa'a. 46 years later, there was a flood that hits Medina and there was a stream that particularly hit the part of the graves of Abdullah ibn Amr and Amr ibn Jamuh. And Ibn Hibban actually narrates that they used to say that this is Qabr al akhawain this is the, the grave of the two brothers. So they were on the edge of the graves of the people of Uhud, and when people would walk by, they'd say, this is the grave of the brothers, Amr and Abdullah. So there was water that came there, and it damaged that part, the edge of the shuhada of Uhud. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed it that those two bodies would come out. Amr ibn al-Jamuh and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-Haram, the father of Jabir. And this is narrated by multiple people. They said, wallahi, their bodies were as fresh as the day that they died. 46 years later, 46 years after the battle, and the people of Medina are gathered around, and not many of them were, were, were young enough, or were old enough, right, at that point, uh, to have witnessed that to actually see them when they were dead. So they go rushing to the house of Jabir. How do you go tell a man that your father's body just came up after 46 years? Come see your father after 46 years. So they go and they tell Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu that your, your father's body came out. They're gonna rebury him. And Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes to see his father after 46 years from the most traumatic day of his life. And subhanAllah, his body was so fresh, so beautiful. And they said it was so fresh that it was to the point that Abdullah had a, uh, had a wound. And when they buried him, they put his hand in a way that it was holding the wound. And when his hand came loose 46 years later, the blood kept flowing. So they put his hand back when they reburied him. That's how precise and how fresh his body was 46 years later, this man who Allah spoke to directly without any hijab. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ask me anything. And he said, Ya Rabb, let me go back and die for you. Can't send you back. Then tell the people that are there that we're okay, that we're doing well, subhanAllah. So they buried him. And uh, Amr ibn al-Jamuh, who the Prophet said, I saw walking in Jannah without a limp. They buried them once again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them and be pleased with all of the companions and all of the shuhada. So 86 years after Hijrah, Jabir radiallahu anhu passes away from natural causes at the age of 94 years old. And the son of Uthman ibn Affan, Aban ibn Uthman ibn Affan, Aban ibn Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhuma leads his janazah in al Medina, And it was one of the largest attended uh, janazahs that the people had seen. I mean, imagine the news the last major companion, the last centerpiece of that civilization in Medina has just passed away. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa an abihi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him and his father and all of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu and gather us with them in the highest level of firdaus al-a'la with our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khaira. Inshallah ta'ala next week we will talk, it'll be a shorter halaqa, we'll talk about Sa'ad ibn Khaythama uh, and his father. May Allah be pleased with him and Kulthum ibn al-Hadim. Uh, and that will set the stage for, inshallah ta'ala, the week after where we, where we will start with the seerah of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.